speak to us in a very special way. Thank you for your people that have gathered here today, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. God's people said, amen. 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 You know, I want to talk to you today about interpreting Scripture correctly. We're in a series of messages entitled, God's Word, Know It and Live It. We've been talking about knowing God's Word and living it. I told you uh, last week or a couple of weeks ago that uh, in any sermon or any Bible study or in any understanding of God's Word, there are four important elements in understanding God's Word. The first one is observation. In observation, you simply ask yourself, what does the Bible say? And for you to know what the Bible says, you've got to read it. You're not going to know what it says if you don't read it. But in reading it, you, you know what it says. That's observation. The second thing that you have to do is interpretation. You ask the question, okay, I read it. I know what it says. But what does it mean by what it says? What is the meaning of what I read? That's called interpretation. And then the third thing that needs to happen in our Bible study is what we call correlation. Correlation is when you don't understand a particular passage, you ask yourself, are there other places in the Bible where it talks about this? Are there other places in the Bible that will help me understand what I just read? And most of the time, there is. That's called correlation. And I talked to you last week a little bit about how you do that. And then the fourth thing is application. Application is the most important part of Bible study or any sermon. And application asks the question, What am I going to do about it? What is God telling me to do? What do I need to do as a result of what I've learned today? You see, the purpose of studying the Bible or going to church and hearing a sermon, it isn't given, it isn't to increase our knowledge. You know, uh, the Bible wasn't given to just give us facts and more information. It was given to change our lives, to transform our lives. And that's application. God wants to take his word and he wants to transform your life. He wants to change your life. And the only way you're going to know how God wants your life changed is by spending time in God's Word. What I want to do today is I want us to look at and I want us to talk about how do I understand the meaning of a text or how do I interpret Scripture correctly? You know, uh, people say, for example, people say, you know what, God doesn't expect us to be successful. He just expects us to be faithful. And there's some truth to that. But the Bible teaches us that not only does God expect you to be faithful in life, He expects you to be fruitful. You're to bear fruit. You know, Jesus says, the Lord says, you know, I, uh, I, I saved you. I created you. I put my Holy Spirit in you. I expect you to live a fruitful life. So here's the truth of the matter. God wants us to be faithful, but he wants us to be fruitful. And I have always interpreted fruitful as successful in whatever we decide to do. But uh, one of the things that, that you need to know is that there's a lot of scriptures that you read, and uh, sometimes you don't know what they mean, and you don't know how to interpret it. That was the reason that for a thousand, over a thousand years, the Catholic Church, when they were in control, they would not allow the people to read the Bible. I can remember my father telling me that he grew up as a Catholic and they had a Bible, but his mother told him, we can't read that book. It's a holy book. We're not holy people. That's why we go to church on Sunday and, and the priest will open it up. And when he reads it, that's when we listen to it. And whatever he explains, that's what we believe. And he says, we grew up with the fear of uh, the Bible, of not reading it. We, weren't, we couldn't open it up. And for, uh, during the Dark Ages, for over a thousand years, that was the policy of the Catholic Church. And that's not, I'm not making it up. I'm not lying to you. That's history. And the reason they did that, they were afraid that people would misinterpret the Bible. Back then, most 90% of people were, were uneducated. They were illiterate, didn't even know how to read, were not educated. And the concern was, is if we, let, if we left the Bible to the masses for them to read it and for them to try to make meaning out of it, they would make a mess. And that was their reasoning. And that's why they didn't do it. But God says that the word was given for us. The word was given for the masses. It was re- given for you to read it. And yes, you can draw some conclusions. And yes, you can not only uh, uh, have observations about what it says, you can interpret it, you can find other scriptures, but you must apply it. And it's for everybody. You know, it's called the priesthood of the believers. We all have access to God. We all have access to God's word and we should reading it. We should be reading it. But the question still is, how do we interpret it? What is the right way to interpret it? You know, Jesus speaks uh, a lot. I, I, I mentioned to you about being fruitful. Uh, Jesus talked a lot about the importance of bearing fruit as a believer. We're to be fruitful. In the Gospel of John, in chapter 15, Jesus spoke in great detail about that. And by the way, chapter 15 of John is a rich chapter. There's a lot of spiritual insight. There's, it's power packed with truth. Uh, I'm not going to try to explain to you all that it says in, in 35, 40 minutes. But what I want to do is I want to focus primarily 
on this idea of fruit. Jesus said, you and I are supposed to bear fruit. We're supposed to be fruit bearers. And listen to this. Every, every scripture, every, every Bible passage only has one meaning. It might have a lot of different applications, but it only has one interpretation. It doesn't have 10 interpretations. You know, so there are correct, correct ways to interpret the Bible, and there are incorrect ways to interpret the Bible. If you really want to, anybody can take the Bible and make it say whatever they want to. But to do that, they would have to misinterpret it. They would have to spin it. They would have to give it a meaning that never was intended. And that happens all the time. That's why there are cults. That's why there are so many different points of view. And the reason that happens is that people take a scripture and they interpret it whichever way they want, the way they think it should be interpreted. And it's not always right. It's not always right according to the rules of interpretation. So, for example, let me, uh, in John chapter 15 and verse 6, there's, a, there's a, a verse there, and probably no verse is more misinterpreted than verse 6. And notice what it says. Jesus said these words. Jesus says, if anyone doesn't remain in me, he's like a branch that's thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, they're thrown into the fire, and they are burned. So Jesus is talking about bearing fruit in chapter 15. And a tree that doesn't bear fruits, all it's good is for firewood. That's what Jesus is saying. It's all good to take the branches and, uh, you know, use them as firewood. And there are some Bible teachers that will explain this verse and tell you this. This is what Jesus is saying. Jesus is talking about fruit. And the fruit that Jesus is talking about is you winning souls. And if you're not winning souls, if you're not bringing people to Christ, you're unfruitful. And if you're, not, if you're unfruitful, God's going to throw you into hell. Because that's what throwing the branches into the fire means. That's what they'll tell you. So what they'll do is that they'll use this verse to sort of put Christians on a guilt trip. you got to be out there winning souls. But, which, by the way, is a biblical concept. But that's not what it's talking about here. And says, if you're not, you know what's going to happen? You're going to go to hell. So, they're, so they'll say, get out there. Bring them in. All right? But it totally ignores all the rules of biblical interpretation. Because that's not what that verse is saying. That is definitely what Jesus, that is not definitely what Jesus is saying. So I want to talk to you today about some basic rules of biblical interpretation. All right, if you're going to interpret the Bible right, there are, there's a whole bunch. I'm going to give you four. And let me give them to you right off the top so that you'll know what I want to talk about. The, the, the rules of interpretation, and they're the numbers. Number one is a historical context. You have to know the historical context. And I'm going to explain that to you. Number two is you got to define key words. You must define the key words. Number three is you got to interpret unclear verses with clear ones. Unclear verses, you got to go and interpret them finding the clear verses, and they're there. And number four, look for the most obvious meaning. The uh, meaning is very obvious. You're going to see it. You're going to know it. Those are four of the major rules of interpretation when it comes to the Bible. So the first one is the historical context. You say, well, Pastor, what is that? In other words, the historical context is you got to, you got to understand uh, who is this being spoken to and why. In other words, who, who are they talking to? Before you can ever ask, what does this verse mean to me? You need to ask, what did it mean to the people these words were directed to? How did they understand it? What did they understand from what Jesus was saying? We call that the original meaning of the text. And that's essential. That is important. What did those, hearing the words of Jesus, what did they understand or did they not understand? And sometimes they didn't, but most of the time they did. By the way, let me give you a little bit of historical context and background about what, what is happening here. The words that are in John chapter 15 were spoken by the Lord Jesus Christ the night he was betrayed, the night prior to his arrest and his crucifixion. This is the last conversation that Jesus is having with his 12 apostles. They are the group that he's talking to. Jesus, the night before he goes and to pray to the Garden of Gethsemane and gets arrested and then taken and, and beaten and crucified eventually the next day, Jesus wanted to have a private conversation with his disciples. So what he does is that he goes to a private room. <clears throat> we know it as the upper room. And he goes there, and he goes there to celebrate the Passover with his disciples, but he also goes there to spend some last hours with them and sort of give them his last instructions. This was his last conversation. And in his last conversation, Jesus is going to give them the most important things that he has told them all the three and a half years. He's going to highlight. He's going to remind them, hey guys, this is the most important thing. You guys got to remember this. 
You know, these are the followers that for three and a half years, they have been with the Lord Jesus Christ throughout his ministry. And uh, he has this conversation. And by the way, the conversation doesn't start in John 15. It actually starts in John chapter 13. In John chapter 13, they get there. We know they get to the upper room and Jesus begins to have this conversation. And the conversation that he has with them is found in John chapter 13, John chapter 14, John chapter 15, John chapter 16. And they take off, and, and after chapter 14, they go to the garden, and he's talking to them, and they're at the garden, he goes, and he wants to pray, and he prays for them, and it is there that he is arrested, and then he's taken, and he's tried. But to understand the context, you have to go and look at all the conversation Jesus had with them on this particular night. So let me tell you what that conversation looked like. It's in the upper room in John chapter 13. Let me just read a little bit to you and tell you how he started the conversation. It's John 13 verse 1. Notice what it says. It says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father. In other words, he knows what's going to happen that night. He knows the next day he would be crucified. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Who are these? His apostles, his disciples, his followers. But in this case, the twelve that are with him that night. And supper being ended, the devil already having put into the hearts of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from the Father and was going to the Father, he rose from supper and he laid aside his garments. And he took a towel and he girded himself. And after that, he poured water into a basin and he began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Now, in those days, everybody wore sandals, open-toed shoes. They didn't have any pavement. It was very dusty. And uh, it was common if you went to somebody's house or right before dinner, you would, there would be somebody, and it was usually the lowest level slave of the house. They would be there and their job was to take off your sandals and wash your feet. And uh, two things happened. It, gave, it refreshed you, but also when you would lay down, because they didn't sit down like us to have lunch. They sort of inclined themselves. And uh, as they're inclined, the feet of one person was at the face of another person. So they didn't want your crusty, dirty, smelly feet at somebody's face. So it was, let's wash them, all right? And uh, nobody was there because it was a rented room. It was a, a borrowed room or a rented room. And uh, Jesus is waiting to see if any of his disciples would do that. Of course, none of them do it because they're all full of pride. As a matter of fact, we know they're arguing about who would be the greatest in the kingdom. They're positioning themselves. They're, they're looking for position. They're, 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 they're competing with one another. And the Bible says that when Jesus saw that none of them would do it, the Bible says that Jesus got up, took off the outer, outer garment, which was a clothes, got a towel, wrapped it around, got the basin, put some water that, that was already there, and he began to wash their feet. And it sort of blows their mind because they know who does that. And that's way too low of a job for Jesus to be doing. Way, way. So after he starts watching, wa washing their feet, they're all, they're all perplexed. They're all like, wow, what's going on? And he comes to Peter and Peter says, Lord, you're not going to wash my feet. Uh -uh, there's no way. And Jesus tells Peter, Peter, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part of me. So then Peter says, well, in that case, take, give me a, a bubble bath, a sponge bath. I mean, you know, <laughs> wash me all the way through. And uh, that's what Jesus did. And after he had finished, after he had done that, he put back his cloak, his outer garment, and he sat down and he says, you guys have seen what I have done. And I being your teacher, I being your master, I have stooped down and I have served you. And you know, what we see in that picture, what Jesus basically is pointing out to them through that event, it's a wonderful, beautiful picture. It's a wonderful example of serving each other, of loving each other, of being there for one another. Now, Jesus does that because he wants them to understand before he goes and he dies. He wants them to know this is super important. You know, what's going to happen in the next couple of hours is going to devastate you. You know what? You're going to be confused. You guys are going to be hurting. And it's important that you be there for one another. And that you love one another. And that you serve one another. And that you, you're aware of the needs of one another. He's telling them, guys, you're going to need to love each other. You're going to need to serve each other. And for the rest of chapter 13, Jesus emphasizes the importance of loving and of serving each other. He wanted them to know that. That was super important. And he had mentioned that to them before, but he wanted to sort of illustrate it and highlight it. Serve and love. Your family, you're going to need each other. How many of you know we do need each other? 
You know, many of you are closer to me and my wife than our families. Our families, none of them live here. They live in Arizona or, or different parts, and you are our family. We've always needed you. You have been our encouragement. You've been uh, the ones that have loved us and been there for us through, through all the sea. And that's true for all of us. That's true for, for the body of Christ. So after saying that, in chapter 14, Jesus, after he does that, in chapter 14, same conversation, same place, Jesus makes some promises. And that's where Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. You know what? If you believe in me, believe in God, I go and I prepare. And you guys know the scripture. But basically what Jesus says in the same conversation, by this time Judas has left, he tells them, you guys don't need to worry. I'm going to heaven. And I'm going to prepare a place for you so that where I am at, you will be there. So you might not understand all that's going on, but I am going to prepare a place for you. And then he tells him in chapter 14, and you don't need to worry. Because even though I won't be around, you can talk to me. You can pray. I'm not going to be here physically, but you can ask anything in my name, and I'm going to do it, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And then after that, he says, and besides that, you're not going to be orphans. I will give you the Holy Spirit. I will send the Holy Spirit, and he will be your strength. He will be your confidence. He'll be your guide. He'll be your counselor. The Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, is going to be here with you. You're not going to be alone. And then at the end of chapter 14, he says, and in this world, you're going to have a lot of tribulation. There's going to be a lot of trouble. You're going to go through some tremendous things, but I'm going to give you the gift of, of, of peace. It's a peace, not as the world gives. In this world, you're going to have problems, but I'm going to give you a peace, and my peace overcomes the world. And that's all found in chapter 14. Now, notice what Jesus is doing. He's encouraging them. He's preparing them for what's going to come up. And then in verse 31 of chapter 14, it says, come now, let's leave this place. At that point, they get out of the upper room there in Jerusalem, and they start making their way to the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, Jesus, by this time, is, there's only 11. Judas has left uh, during earlier. And they're going to leave the upper room, which is Jerusalem. Jerusalem is on a hill. And uh, the Mount of Olives, where, the, where Gethsemane is at, the Garden of Gethsemane, is on another hill, uh, parallel to it. So you have to go down, you have to go down the city, and you go through a valley, and then you climb up to the Mount of Olives, and the, and the Garden of Gethsemane is there. And that's what they're doing in chapter 15. They're moving toward the Garden of Gethsemane. In that valley, that valley is called the Kidron Valley. And for those of you that have been to Israel or are going to go to Israel with us again, you're going to see it. It's beautiful. Back then, you know, as you left the city of Jerusalem and you went through the Kidron Valley, there were all these vineyards. Vineyards are where you grow, grow grapes, and the purpose of the grapes was for wine. You go today, there are no vineyards. There's a big old cemetery, huge cemetery about a thousand year, year, you know, years old, and it's, it's, it's all a bunch, uh, bunch of tombs, and it's pretty amazing. But as they're leaving, that's where they're going. They're, it, was, it was vineyards, and in chapter 15, in verse 1, notice what Jesus says. He starts this teaching. He starts this dialogue about uh, fruit, using the, the, the vines, using the grapes. And he says this in verse 1, I am the vine. My father is the vine keeper. Every branch that stays connected to me is going to bear fruit. But if you get disconnected from me, you're not going to bear fruit. So Jesus says, he, he gives them an object lesson, probably cut off some grapes, cut off a piece of the vine, and says, you see this vine? If it's not connected, it's not going to give grapes. I disconnected it. And in the same way, you guys need to stay close to me. You need to stay connected to me. And if you stay connected to me, you're going to bear a lot of fruit. In other words, he, he, he is telling, not only do you have to love and serve one another, not only am I going to prepare a place, you guys can pray to me, you know what, I'm sending the Holy Spirit, I'm going to give you peace, but you need to stay close to me, you need to stay collected. That's the lesson. Verse 11 of chapter 15, he tells them this. He goes, I've told you this. Well, what did he tell them? Everything he's told them that night about serving, about loving, about heaven, about how you can always pray, about the Holy Spirit, about the gifts of peace, about bearing fruit. This is all one conversation. All of this, he goes, I've told you all of this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. So who is he talking to? He's talking to his 11 apostles that are there. And what is he saying to them? Well, he's trying to encourage them. Now, what do you think the odds are as that Jesus is telling them, if you're not out winning souls, I'm going to throw you in hell, and you're going to burn in hell, and I want nothing to do with you. What are the chances of him telling them that? Not even close. How people draw their conclusions, I'll tell you why they draw those conclusions, 
They misinterpret the Bible. They give it whatever meaning they want. Jesus didn't say that at all. Jesus is saying, I tell you this so that your joy may be full, so that you may be encouraged. All right? Do you think it would be joyful to say, by the way, I'm leaving, and if you don't stay connected, you're going to go to hell. And if you're not winning souls, you're going to go to hell. And I want nothing to do with you, bunch of knuckleheads. I don't think so. I don't think that's what he's saying. I know that's not what he's saying. But when people take the Bible and do whatever they want with it, they will make you believe that's what it's saying. So the first thing you do is you look at the verses before and after. You look at the context, the historical context. That's principle number one. And when you do that, you'll see it, how it fits. It's similar today. If you're having a conversation with somebody, give you an idea of, con if you're having a conversation and someone walks by and only hears a piece of the conversation and then goes out and says, you know what I heard Pastor Victor say? Oh, let me give you a better example. I'm out there and I greet one of the sisters and I hug her and she gives me a kiss and you pass by and you just see her hug her and kiss me. You go, uh-oh. Wonder what that's all about. And you go out and you start gossiping. You know, I don't know, Pastor, that sister, got so, I saw her kiss him on the cheek. You know, a little bit closer to the mouth too. I'm a little bit concerned about that. And you might not even know that's my daughter. That might be my sister in the flesh. Or it might just be a good sister that lo lo loves me. And you know, I, but if you take a little piece of it and draw a conclusion, you're spinning it the wrong way. And a lot of people do that with the Bible. They spin it. They're spinsters. Amen. That's what they do. And they confuse people. And they come up with these weird ideas that confuse people. So what does it say in context? Here's the second rule of interpretation. You've got to define the key words. In all the Bible, there are key words. You've got to understand what those key words mean, not what you think they mean. You know, like when Jesus says, I am the, the vine and my father is the, uh, you know, I am the branch and my father is the vine and, and you guys, you know, you got to be connected to me and he shows them a cluster of grapes. You know, if you don't know, better, you're going to think, is he asking us to act like grapes, behave like grapes, turn into grapes? I, I mean, what, what is he asking? What is that saying? But here's what you need to know. And I told you this already. Words have multiple meanings, even like today. And in the Bible, it's the same thing. For example, the word batter. For example, if I were to say to you, if, if I say batter, what do you think? The ladies are going to think about that liquid that you use to make a cake. All right? The guys are going to think of a baseball batter. You know, like, eh, batter, 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 batter. Remember that? Batter, batter, eh, batter, batter. Remember that? You can use, they, they mean different things. And you know what's even interesting in the Bible and even in conversations today? You can use the same word in the same sentence and they mean different things. That same word means different things, even the same sentence. So, for example, if I were to say, you know that song that, that the guy sang, that the brother sang, it's a bomb, which vernacular today, it's a great song, but he bombed it. Amen. <laughs> right? It means the opposite. The bomb, it's great, but he bombed it, did a terrible job. Same word. And in English and in the Greek and in the Hebrew, that, is very, that, is, that also happens. So notice what he says in, in, in there. He, in, the, in John chapter 15, in the first 17 verses, you're going to find the, root, the, 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 the word fruit. The word fruit is used nine times in verses 1 through 17 of John 15. Because that's an important word. And you've got to know what that means. You have to be able to define what it means when he says fruit. And here's what we know by reading it. One of the observations is that, you know what, God expects me to bear fruit in my life. That's, that's what it's about. And if God expects me to bear fruit, I better know what fruit is and what he's talking about. People say, well, I, I know what fruit is. And people will come up with all kinds of different ideas. But do you know that the word fruit is used 44 times, uh, nine times just in those 17 verses, but 44 times in the New Testament. And of those 44 times in the New Testament, it has 10 different meanings doesn't mean the same. For example, in Matthew chapter 3, verse 8, the word fruit is there, and it, it speaks of fruit worthy of repentance. In other words, that talks about, you know, fruit, stuff that shows that you're a believer. In other words, a lifestyle uh, that's evident that you have Christ in your heart. That's the fruit, your, 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 how you act. Over there in Matthew 26, 29, it talks about the fruit of the vine. And that's wine. It's talking about wine, the fruit of the vine. Romans 7, 5 talks about we bore fruit for death, the fruit of death. That's talking about sinful lifestyle, a lifestyle, actions that are not becoming of a Christian. And they separate us from God. They build walls between us and God. 
Over there in Romans 15:8, Paul says, we received this fruit. And there it's talking about an offering of money that was sent to Paul, and it was fruit. It was, it was good for us. Talking about money. In Galatians 5.22, it talks about the fruit of the Spirit. The nine godly attitudes or characteristics of people who are in the Spirit, walking in the Spirit, full of the Spirit. You know, love, gentleness, peace, all, all, all of those. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 6, you know, he talks about the gospel is bearing fruit and it's growing. And there he's talking about new believers, about new converts, about people coming to Christ. That's the fruit. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15, it's talking about, you know, he says, praise to God, the fruit of our lips. In other words, when you praise the Lord, when you lift his name on high, when you sing, you're, you are, you know what, it is the fruit of our lips. We are praising him. It means praise to God. Fruit. This one word. All of these meanings. So in John chapter 15, what is Jesus talking about when he says we must bear fruit? So that brings us to the third principle of interpretation, and, and here it is. I must interpret unclear verses with clear ones. In other words, if I read something and it's not clear there, is there clarity somewhere else, before or after, or do, are there other places, other gospels, other writings in the Bible, the Bible itself, that clarifies it? There are. So I, I'm asking myself, we have to bear fruit. What does it mean? I know it doesn't mean winning souls, and if you don't win souls, you're going to hell. I know it doesn't mean that. So what does it mean? Well, there's a couple of things, first of all, that are very evident about fruit. The first thing he says in verse 4, notice what he says. There's three characteristics of fruit. So before we answer what is a fruit, notice what fruit does. Don't notice, notice the characteristics of it. In verse 4, he says, remain in me, and I will remain in you. In other words, stay connected, abide, continue. In the Greek word, it's meno, to be connected. And what Jesus is basically saying is that a branch disconnected from a, from a vine is not going to bear fruit. So he says this. He says, no branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. So, so, so whatever Jesus means by fruit, we know that fruit is produced when we remain in Christ. Stay connected to Christ. That's how it comes. That's how it happens. That's what the text says. In other words, uh, 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 grapes, they get their nutrients from the plant. There's a root system. The root system goes through the, through the trunk, and the trunk goes out to the branches. And the nutrients that are flowing through there is what produces fruit. So what does that mean? That means that fruit is an inside job. It is the work of the Holy Spirit. You can't tack you know, uh, it on your life and pretend like you're bearing fruit. Can you imagine if I, I brought a, I was tempted to bring a, a piece of stick and get some uh, some plastic apples and says, look, this is an apple tree. And, and you're going to say, that's not an apple tree. That's a fake apple tree. That's not a real apple tree. And, 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 and what Jesus is saying, you know what, you can't do that. You can't pretend like you're bearing fruit. You know, and, and uh, that would be a problem. You know, fruit comes from remaining. It's the nutrients that flow through the branches, through, from the trunk. But yet today, Jesus, what Jesus is telling them, he's telling them, that's, you need to stay connected. And when you're connected, I will feed you. I will, I will flow through you. And the outcome of my moving in your life will be fruit, whatever that means. Because we, we don't know what that means yet. Or we haven't uh, uh, defined it yet. But that's how it comes. It comes that way. It's not you trying to tack on. And, and one of the problems today with Christians is that, you know what, the Holy Spirit is not working our life, but we know we got to look like and act like, so we tack these little fake fruits on us and say, look it, I'm a Christian, when you really know they're not. Right? It's not tacked on fruit. It's fruit that is produced by remaining in Christ. So we know that. It's produced by remaining in Christ. And then in verse 8, he says something else. He says, this is my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourself to be my disciples. Notice that he says there that when you bear fruit, it brings glory to God. In other words, when I bear fruit, it makes God look good. People know it's not me. People know there's something happening inside of me, and they want to know what is it. You know, those, those apples are beautiful. They're not fake. They're real. And I'm sure, you know, they're, they're, deli it's, they're, de they're delicious. People see it. And he says, you know what? That brings glory to God. That makes God look good. Because it's not about you. It's the work of God. And then in verse 11, he says the third thing about fruit. He says, I've told you this. Now, Jesus is talking so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. In other words, bearing fruit will give us complete joy. This is joy. So notice, bearing fruit is produced by remaining in Christ. It brings glory to God. 
and it's going to give me complete joy. But we still haven't answered the question, what does fruit mean? Well, that takes us to the fourth principle of interpretation, and it's this. Look for the most obvious meaning. Now, if you don't do this, you're going to get in a lot of trouble. You're going to come to some bad conclusions. You have to uh, look at all of these rules. And sometimes people do a terrible job in uh, breaking down Scripture because they don't know these rules. And by the way, all of these stories, another problem that a lot of uh, Bible teachers and pastors do is that they'll take the story and they want to give every little part of the story a meaning. You know, well, what does fire mean? Well, it's hell. You know, the Bible talks about fire. Always talk. Well, no, listen. When the Bible talks about hell, it uses a different word in the Greek than the word that is used here. The, the word used here, you know what word it is? It's a simple word for fire. Not hell. Fire that was used to cook, to light up their home, to warm them up. Fire that happens with the flint and with wood. That, that's what he's talking about. And, he's not, and the emphasis is not here on the fire. The emphasis here is not on anything else, but except the fruit, the branches, the vine, and the fruit. That's what's important here. All right? And that's what Jesus is trying to get across. So let me read to you that problem verse again. It says, if anyone does not, verse 6, does not remain in me, he's thrown aside like a branch, and he withers, and they gather them, and they throw them into the fire, and they are burned. Now here's the simple point Jesus is trying to make. And this is it. You guys are like trees, and you've been planted. And a fruitless tree has lost its purpose. The purpose of a fruit tree is to bear fruit. And if it doesn't bear fruit, it's only good for firewood. And you know what they use firewood for? They use it for cooking. They didn't have coal. They didn't have gas. There were no microwaves. So he says, so a fruitless tree is only good for firewood. And you guys weren't designed to just be firewood. And he's not talking about firewood for hell, just firewood in general. He goes, that's not why you were saved. But he's not telling them, you know what, guys, you better win souls or you better have, you know, you better be, have a lot of good stuff in your life or otherwise I'm going to send you to hell. And that's where a lot of people get these ideas that, you know what, if you're not, and they'll take those scriptures that I gave you earlier that talk about fruit and they'll say, that is the fruit that God is talking about. In other words, you got to pray. And if you don't praise him the way you're supposed to, he's going to throw you into hell. There's one right way to praise God. If you're not giving money, because one of them refers to money, you're going to go to hell. You know what, if you're not, you know, if, if you don't watch your lifestyle, you're going to go, and, and, and they apply it that way. And I want to tell you, that's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is trying to encourage them, not discourage them. Jesus is trying to build them up, not kick them down and send them to hell. He knows they're going to struggle. He knows they're going to go through a rough time. He's trying to build them up. He's trying to get them ready. So he's not talking about hell. He's trying to speak life into them. That's what he's trying to do. So in verse 7, he says this. He says, if you remain in me and my word remains in you. Now, what have we been talking about of the word? So how do you remain? How does this connection happen? You have to be in my word. The word is the source of, of nurture. It's the nutrients. It is, it is what gives us. It is what, what fills us. You know? it's, what, it's, the, it's what flows in us. It's what God uses to work in our lives so that we may have fruit. But notice what he says. And... It, you know, my word remains in you. You may ask whatever you wish, and it will be given to you. Now he's talking about prayer. By the way, when you read chapter 15, there's a lot of references there to prayer. And Jesus is saying there, you know what? You guys can pray. I'll be there. Uh, you can talk to me. And uh, I'm going to, whatever you ask, if you're connected, I'm going to give it to you. I will bless you. It will be given unto you. Now, there are some people that will say, well, Pastor, you know, I have prayed. I've asked God for a lot of things, and I didn't get them. Listen, if God doesn't give you what you asked for, it's because he has something better. God will never give you something worse than you asked for. God doesn't say, well, he doesn't know what he's asking. He's going to do a marm. I'm going to give it, but I'm going to show him, you know, knucklehead. He should, you know, God doesn't do that. God's like you with your kids. If it was up to your kids, they would eat candy for breakfast, for lunch, and for dinner. Amen. But you don't let them. You know what? They would, want, they would want hamburgers. They want McDonald's morning, afternoon. But you don't, you don't, you don't cave in to them because you know it's not good for them. And that's the way God is. Listen, God knows what's better. And God is God and you're not. And when you pray, don't ask God for what you think is good. Tell God, God, I want you to give me what you know is good for me because you know what I need more than I do and what's best for me. And that's really what I want. All right? And that's what that verse says. Jesus said, you know what? As you're connected, as you stay connected, that's what it is. 
and he talks a lot about prayer. So I, let me so let me give you some insight, and let me give you let me suggest to you that even though the theme here is fruit, I want to suggest to you that what Jesus is really saying is that uh, the most important thing in this is that you stay connected. Because fruit comes as you're connected. And one of the ways that fruit is produced is through your prayer life. Prayer. He talks about prayer. In other words, Jesus is getting with his disciples and he's going to give them a secret. He's going to give them something that he understood and he learned during his ministry. When he would tell them, I and the Father are one, and he would get away and he would pray and he would spend time in prayer. And we ask ourselves, why would Jesus have to pray so much? Because it's important. So what Jesus begins to talk to them in the midst of, you know, bearing fruit and all of this other stuff that we talked about is that, you know, the way that happens is through prayer. Prayer is, is, is the roots to the branch. To, it's through which the nutrients come. You know what? Through the branch, through the, through the, uh, through the trunk, through the branches, through the vine, into the, the grapes. Prayer is what does it. And that's why he talks to them a lot about prayer. And that's why in, in verse 13, notice what he says in verse 13. I will do whatever you ask. There's our phrase. In my name, so that the Son may bring glory to the Father, you may ask for anything in my name, and I will do it. Notice, remaining in Christ produces answered prayer as we're connected and we're spending time in prayer. Notice one of the things that happens, one of the, the causes and one of the uh, things that, that happens is as we pray, God begins to work in our lives. Prayer is essential. And then he says, notice what he says also that, that prayer brings glory to God. Notice answer prayer brings glory to God. That's what he says there. And then also in verse 24, he says this. He says, now, until now, chapter 16, which is the same conversation, verse 24, he says, until now, you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete. Answered prayer gives me complete joy. It brings joy into our lives. So he, he begins to talk a lot about prayer. Over 20 times in the New Testament, you know what? It says, ask and it shall be given. Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will be opened. James says, you have not because you ask not. In other words, there's power in prayer. Prayer is the basis of everything. And, and God never shuts his storehouse until we shut our mouth. There's so many things God wants to do, but because we don't pray, it doesn't happen. You have not because you ask not. Prayerlessness. And he spends a lot of time in this conversation with them talking about prayer. So Jesus is telling his disciples, listen, I'm not going to be here with you anymore, but you can talk to me anytime and you can ask. And when you don't pray, you know what? You don't cheat God. You cheat yourself. When you don't pray, you don't hurt God. You hurt yourself. You cheat yourself of all of the fruit God wants to produce in your life. Because bearing fruit brings glory to God. Bearing fruit gives me complete joy. And answered prayer comes from remaining in Christ. Answered prayer brings glory to God. Gives me complete joy. And that's what he's talking to them about. Guys, I'm going to be leaving, and you can talk to me. And as I talk to you, and you stay connected to me, you're going to bear a lot of fruit. And then in verse 16 of chapter 15, notice what he says. He ends his talk with this to them in chapter 15. He says, you did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. And that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give to you. I bear fruit by asking in prayer. So what is fruit? Fruit is what is produced in our lives when we pray. And what does it look like? It looks like love. It looks like serving. It looks like trusting God. You know what? All those things that he has been talking to them about, that's the fruit. And the most important one is loving God and loving each other. You know what? And Jesus is talking to them about fruit that comes through prayer. Prayer is the root of all the fruit. All, everything in our lives comes from prayer. You know, one of the, I, I think that one of the reasons why uh, sometimes uh, we don't see God move in our lives is we're not asking. We're not praying. And you know why we're not praying? Because we're not connected. What, what do you mean, Pastor Vic? Well, here's what I mean. Do you think I'm going to go talk to somebody that I don't trust? Do you think I'm going to go talk to someone and spill my guts and share my life and open up to them if I don't trust them? If I'm going to talk to someone, I'm going to talk to someone that I, that I trust, that I have a connection with, that we are connected. 
that will hear me, that loves me, and cares about me. What gives me the confidence and the trust to talk to that person is the connection that we have. If I have no connection, I won't talk to them. And I fear that sometimes the reason we don't go to God as much as we should, the connection is not there. And then guilt comes and says, well, you know, you only go to him when you need him. And that is true. I mean, you know, that is true. You know, because that's one of the problems. We treat prayer as if it's a spare tire. You know, when you have a flat, your life goes flat, and you're in trouble, you pull out prayer. Oh, let's pull out the flat. Let's pray. When, you know what, prayer shouldn't be the flat, a flat, you know, it shouldn't be the, the tire for the flat. Prayer should be the steering wheel for our lives. That's where, that's what guides us and directs us. And Jesus is trying to get that across. So let me put it this way. This is what Jesus is saying. Much prayer, much fruit. Little prayer, little fruit. No prayer, no fruit. If you're not praying, Jesus says you don't have any fruit in your life. You're just hanging apples on a barren tree. You're just putting out there to look, you know, like you're a believer. But it's really not coming from a work of the Holy Spirit within. It is just you putting it on to impress people. Because Jesus is saying this. This is what he's getting to. It all comes through prayer. That's where it's at. The more I pray, the more fruit I'm going to have. But we have trouble with prayer. And the only time we pray is when we're in trouble. Church, listen to me. You know, one of the things that we need to understand is that we have to be a praying people. And I know, I know it's hard because we have in our minds, but pastor, I have nothing to say. You know, I try to pray and nothing comes out. You know, and I'm thinking, really? I mean, I have, a, I have tons of things to pray for. I, 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 Lord, this family lost a loved one. God, you know, my, this and that, my children, you know, Bob. I, I have tons of stuff. And sometimes I have so much to, to, to pray about that I have to tell the Lord, Lord, you know all that's in my heart. And then the Lord reminds me, are you going to praise me? And I said, Lord, forgive me. I haven't praised you. Things that I'm thankful for. Sometimes we get so caught up in all the things that we need, but we don't realize that praying is part of being thankful. So then I have to say, Lord, I am thankful. And that's a whole bunch of other stuff that time doesn't permit. Then I say, Lord, you know all the things that I'm thankful for. But when people say to me, I have nothing to pray for, I'm like, really? You know what it says? There's no connection. There's no awareness of what God is doing. So let me tell you this. You got nothing to pray for? Pray for me at least. I mean, put me on the list. <laughs> 16 things. Victor, 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 Victor. Pray for me. I need your prayers. You know what Jesus is saying here? The way you bear fruit. And fruit, we know now what it is. It's by praying. Everything God does is because he's working in our lives and we've given him permission and we've asked him. You got to pray about everything, in everything, for everything. Amen. That's what the Bible says. So what is Jesus saying? Jesus is telling them, guys, I'm going to be leaving. And you know what? I need you to stay connected. And I need you to love one another and serve one another and talk to me and, and let the Holy Spirit work in your life. And, and you know what? I'm going to give you peace because you're going to have trouble. But the only way this is going to happen is you're connected and you're spending time talking to me in prayer because prayer brings a lot of things about wonderful things that you can't do. You see, a tree, a tree when it bears fruit, an apple tree when it bears apples, it's not the tree trying to bear apples. The tree doesn't say, come on, apples, come on, apples, or the apple saying, I want to be brighter and sweeter, and I want to be bigger. No, it's a, it's a natural outcome of a, the nutrients that are feeding it. So, you know, when people say being a Christian is hard, it is difficult. But when you are connected and praying and bearing fruit, it's a natural outcome of the work of God's Spirit. That's why some of you say, you know what, Pastor, I used to cuss a lot, and I just stopped. I don't even remember how. I didn't even try. I know, it's the work of the Spirit of God. Amen. Just doing it. And you know what? I would never have given a dime to anybody or the church. And now I find myself writing a check. And I, I don't even know why. It's the work of the Spirit working in you, telling you that's what God wants. I would never have given time to serve anybody. It was all about me. And now I want to help people. It's the work of the Spirit in you, bringing fruit. I care now. I didn't care. It's the work of the Spirit. That's the way it works. That's what Jesus is saying. We need to stay connected. We need to pray. And in doing that, we will bear fruit. Here's the application. I like what uh, Matthew 7:24. And by the way, Matthew 7:24 is our your memory verse for next week. It says everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house upon the rock. In other words, I got to put it in practice. What you learn today about prayer is you Jesus says, "You know what? A wise man hears my word, leaves 
and, and builds his life, his house upon it. And when the storms come, it's going to sand. But you know what happens a lot? We go to church. Do you know that Sunday, today, around the United States, around the world, a lot of people are going to hear some amazing sermons. But I suggest to you that the majority of them have no intentions of doing anything with what they hear. Majority of people are going to go to church because that's what we do on Sunday. That's what Christians do. And I'm a Christian. And I'm going to sing my few songs. And I'm going to raise my hand if they let me. And I'm going to pray. And I'm going to sit down. And I'm going to take good notes. You know, because Pastor Vic's nice enough to give us notes so that we forget. But deep inside, there is nothing that says, I wonder what God wants to say to my life today, so that it will transform me and it would help me. Very few sit in church and say, you know, I got to do this. And I'm going to leave here and I'm going to do something about, there's five things that came to mind. I can't do all, I'm going to do one. That's what Jesus is saying, that the wise man, you know what, that, that knows the word, he hears it and he goes and he puts it in practice. You see, you can fill your mind with every Bible fact and every Bible background, and you can know the Greek and the Hebrew, and you can know all the doctrines, and you can know everything. But if you're still cranky, and you gossip, and you treat your kids and your wife or your husband, and if you swear, and if you're watching porn on TV, and you're impatient, you, you, you haven't gotten deep. Nothing has happened. Deep has nothing to do with knowing all the Bible. It has to do with changing your life. It's not deep if it's not changing your life. I would rather get something very shallow that isn't deep, but it impacts me. And I leave here and I say, I'm going to do something about it. So today God is speaking to you about your prayer life, about your connectiveness to him. So let me ask you, what are you going to pray about this week so that you might bear more fruit? What are you going to do about it? Because the Lord says, we got to bear fruit. And some of us know we need more fruit. I, Lord, I need, there needs to be more fruit, more, more things happening in my life, in my spiritual life, in my marriage. You know, and, and Lord, I need fruit. So you need to pray, Lord, multiply the fruit. Jesus said, you have not because you ask not. Leave here today. Circle something and say, this is what I'm going to do. I'm, I'm going to pray. I'm going to abide. I'm going to let the Holy Spirit work in my life. Amen. Hide the word of God in your heart that you won't sin against him. That's what God wants. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. And as every head is bowed and every eye is closed, one of the things that I've been hammering home and hitting home is that of all of the things that we do with the Bible from observing to uh, interpreting to correlating it, the most important is the fourth one. It's applying it to our lives. And I want to encourage you to apply it to your life. Connect, get connected with the Lord. Not religiously, but relationally. Spend time talking to him. It doesn't have to be on your knees. Do it there, in your backyard, as your whatever. But talk to him. Talk to him about important things. Tell him, Lord, I want to bear fruit. And I can't do it without you. So I want to pray for you this morning. Lord, thank you that you love us. And thank you that you remind us, Lord, that you created us to bear fruit. Thank you, Lord, that you don't want our lives to be barren. You don't, Lord, you don't want our relationships to be barren. You want our lives to bear fruit. And not just fruit, but much fruit. Thank you, Lord, that you want us to be filled with joy. And Father, it's very clear this morning that the way fruit happens is through prayer. Forgive us, Lord, for treating prayer like a spare tire. We only use it when we're in trouble instead of using it as a steering wheel for our lives. Lord, I pray for our church, that it will be full of fruit bearers. Men and women who are bearing fruit in their, in their lives, in their careers, in their families, in every area, Lord, of their existence. And that they would understand, Lord, it's happening as, as they're connected, as they're spending time engaging the Word, as they're praying. And Lord, the truth of the matter is that prayerlessness characterizes many Christians. Help us to pray more that we may see more fruit in our lives. Lord, I pray for those that don't know Christ and never given their lives to Jesus. I pray that you would draw their hearts, Lord. And Father, as we leave, I, I leave, uh, I want to be more fruitful, Lord. I don't want to be barren. Lord, I want, I want my life to produce results. I, I want my life to count. So I pray that you help me and teach me, Lord, how to pray so that that would happen in my life. Thank you for loving me and dying on the cross for me. Thank you for salvation, Lord. And Father, I ask your blessing upon God's people today. And I do so in Jesus' name.